Okay, then let's start our final session today. Our final speaker is Matthias Kabadir from uh, ETH theory. Uh, he will tell us about uh, the storing dual of uh, free clinical force by Amit. Please start. Okay, well, thank you very much for the invitation. I would have obviously love to be in Kyoto in person, but um, these days uh, one has to do what one can do. So what I want to describe is uh, work I've been doing over the last few years with Rajesh Kopakoma in particular, trying to lead up to what we've uh, more recently worked on uh, earlier this week. So the, the basic idea is uh, to try to understand the ADS-CFT correspondence in some sense to derive it. And in order to understand the challenge of this and what our strategy is, let me remind you of what the basic relation between the parameters of the ADS side and the dual CFT side is. So the, the string coupling constant is related to a one over N, the rank of the gauge theory. And then the other parameter is the radius of the ADS space or the sphere in terms of string units. And that's related to the TUF parameter of the corresponding gauge theory. So it will be typically at large N so that the string coupling constant is small. And then, as you know, at large end, the effective coupling constant of the gauge theory is the TUF parameter. And the TUF parameter is related to the radius in string units. Now, if you try, if you would like to try to prove the ADS-CFT correspondence, you have to be in a regime where you have both sides under control. And given the fact that we only have the gauge theory under control, if the TUF parameter is small, that's basically the regime we should be concentrating on. Now, what this means is, if the top parameter is small, then also the radius in terms of string units is small. And that means we are in the opposite regime to the supergravity regime. I mean, people often say the ads cft duality is a strong weak duality. And what they mean by that is that the supergravity regime corresponds to, so if this is large, that corresponds to strongly coupled H theory. But conversely, if this is small, this corresponds to a highly curved background. And therefore, from a supergravity point of view, it seems pretty inaccessible. But what this means is, uh, what people have, uh, I mean, one way of saying what this means is that this is the regime in which the string is tensionless. And you would believe that some redeeming feature of the fact that the gauge coupling is small should also be visible on the string theory side. Now, what's this special about this background? Well, as I said, it's very, very stringy. The background that's due to uh, uh, weakly coupled or, or free super mills. It's very stringy, but you would expect because the ratchet because the ratchet trajectories have basically come down to have many many massless degrees of freedom, and you would therefore expect it to have, in some sense, a very very big symmetry underlying it, and that should, in some sense, reflect the enormous symmetry that characterizes free super mills. I mean, a free theory has obviously lots of symmetries, and somehow this must also be reflected in the tensionless regime of string theory and ADS. So our vision is that this theory we have obviously under control. And while this theory we can't describe in terms of supergravity, there is a chance that something special will happen when you look at it from a world sheet point of view. There must be something special reflecting the essential free nature of that theory. And we would expect this to mean that the world sheet theory that describes this tensionless regime of string theory and ADS will have a free or maybe a dissolvable world sheet description. That's somehow what you would hope for. There must be something special happening about this string background. And while it's not that supergravity is the right description, clearly you need a world sheet description because it's very, very stringy. But maybe this world sheet description simplifies, becomes much more accessible at the place where the dual theory is weakly coupled. So that's our vision. Our vision is that the best chance to prove the idea CFT correspondence is to try to understand the world sheet description of tensionless strings and relate it directly to free super mills. Now, these are just words, so you may, you, may, you may be skeptical, but there's at least one example where we have very good evidence that this works out, and that's what I'll try to describe during the first half of my talk, and that is the example of ADS3. So the example of ADS3, the conventional string background is string theory in ADS3 cross S3 cross T4, say. Obviously, you could replace T4 by K3, but that doesn't really do much. And then the conventional wisdom is that the CFT dual of that is a conformal feed theory that lives on the same moduli space of conformal feed theories that contains the symmetric orbifold of T4. So the symmetric orbifold of T4 is one specific conformal feed theory. It's 
n copies of T4 divided by the symmetric group. And this n plays the role of the rank of the gauge group. And then a, a general CFT you can obtain by perturbing that CFT by an exactly marginal operator. Now, in order to sort of see whether this picture is correct for the sense of ADS, for the, for the case of ADS3, you have to ask what's the analog of a weakly coupled or free super mills. And the natural idea is that the analog of free super mills in the context of the symmetric orbifold theory is the symmetric orbifold theory itself, because it is n copies of a torus theory. The torus theory is four free bosons and four free fermions. So it's basically four n free bosons, four n free fermions divided by some global constraint that looks a little bit like the Gauss law constraint. So this is probably the, the, the moral analog of free superang mills is the symmetric orbifold theory itself. So if this picture I was sketching earlier is correct, there should be a dual string theory description that's very special. And what we've uh, given strong evidence for, and I'll try to review this, is there is in fact a very explicit world sheet description that is exactly dual to the symmetric orbifold. And it's a theory in terms of free fields, namely it had uh, four symplectic bosons. I'll explain later on exactly what I mean by that. And four free fermions. And they, uh, they make up a free field realization of the super Lie algebra uh, PSU1, I find super Lie algebra PSU1.1 slash two at level one. And this is really a, a specific point in the hybrid formalism of Berkowitz, Waffe, and Rich. And this realizes a specific point in their moduli space. And at that point, we've given very strong evidence that I'll review that this is exactly due to the symmetric orbifold theory itself. So this is an example where this duality really works out in detail and you have both sides under complete control. The symmetric orbifold theory at the symmetric orbifold point, you know the entire spectrum, you can calculate many, many things. Here we propose a specific world sheet theory that's also very explicitly solvable. So you can calculate many, many things. You can calculate the full spectrum, you can calculate correlation functions and so on. And you can check whether they reproduce what the prediction of the symmetric orbifold gives you. And as I'll try to explain to you, this works beautifully and there's no sign there's any problem with this. So encouraged by that fact, but that it works so nicely for ADS3, we've been pondering during the last year or so, what could be the correct world sheet description for free n equals to four super mills. And while in the case of ADS3, we have the hybrid formalism to start from, for the case of ADS5, we're a little bit on our own. So we, our idea was that we shouldn't try to start from a sigma model on ADS5, but rather we should just take this uh, example and see whether we can naturally guess what the higher dimensional version of that world sheet theory should be. And the natural guess you come up with for a variety of reasons is that it should simply be another free field theory that is basically twice the size of the ADS3 free field theory, which consists of eight symplectic bosons and eight free fermions, right? so twice as many as for ADS3. They uh, make up a free field realization of the affine super Lie algebra PSU 2,2 slash 4 at level one. And they look very, very similar to the, the twister string that Berkowitz proposed many years ago. So it's, I mean, the details are a little bit different, but same ballpark. And it looks very much like the sort of twister type description. Now, this theory we have under much less control than the hybrid formalism, where you basically know how to characterize physical states. So this is a bit more vague, but there's a natural guess for what the quantization of that theory should amount to. And if you follow your nose and you, implied, you apply this guess, then what we've shown is that it reproduces exactly the spectrum of n equals to four, a free n equals to four super mills. And when I say spectrum, I mean the entire single particle spectrum, single trace spectrum, but not just the BPS states, the entire degrees of freedom, including all the right multiplicities. So we believe this is a good sign that we are on the right track, but obviously for the case of ADS5, there's much more that needs to be checked. That this is at the earlier stage in the development, but given the success for ADS3 and the parallelness of this construction to the ADS3 construction, we are pretty confident that at least we are essentially doing the right thing. So the plan of the talk is that I'll, I'll spend uh, probably the first half or so on trying to review for you what we know about ADS3, partially because that's really what we know very well. There are many, many checks we've performed. There are many detailed things I can explain to you. And also because 
most of these techniques should really generalize to ADS5, where we are at an earlier stage of the development and these things still need to be worked out, but we would expect the essential features to be the same. And then I'll, I'll end with some conclusions and uh, some outlook. Okay, so let me start by reviewing how the story works for ADS3. So, as, uh, as I said earlier, it's been uh, long suspected or known that the CFT dual of string theory in ADS3 cross S3 cross T4 is on the same moduli space of CFTs that also contains the symmetric orbifold theory. So, so the picture you should have in mind is, uh, is as follows. So here you have the string moduli space. So there's, a, there's not just one string theory in ADS3 cross S3 cross T4, you can deform the T4, you can change the flux and so on. So there are many, there are a number of uh, moduli here. And on the dual side, there's also not just one CFT, there's a moduli space of CFTs. And this moduli space contains one preferred point, namely the symmetric orbifold theory itself. And then it contains all the CFTs you can obtain from it by perturbing it by an exactly marginal operator. So there's a whole manifold of CFTs, and it's believed that this manifold maps to this manifold. That's the statement of what people say when they say the string, the CFT dual of string theory in ADS3 cross S3 cross T4 is the symmetric orbifold. What I mean, it's a CFT on the same moduli space that also contains the symmetric orbifold point. Now on this side, there's one preferred point, namely the symmetric orbifold point. And on this side, there's also a preferred line. Namely, these are the SL2R Vesemino written models that describe string theory in ADS3 with pure Nevis Schwartz Nevis Schwartz flux that were pioneered by Maldicina and Ogori uh, at, the, at the turn of the century. So you have the whole moduli space, there's a, some set of theories you have under good control. On the other side, you have a whole moduli space, there's one point you have under good control. So, a natural question to ask is does this point lie anywhere on this line or are they? do they not have anything to do with one another? I mean, given that you have special points, you may be tempted to believe that somehow what's special here should also be special here. Now, the conventional wisdom was that these two theories cannot be related to one another. And the basic reason for that is that the Vesemino written model, Ala Maldesino Oguri, describes a background, so, so this blue line, describes a background with pure Nevis Schwartz, Nevis Schwartz flux, um, because I mean, you can write on a perturbative world sheet theory. And this is known to have what's called long string solutions. These are the string solutions that live near the boundary of ADS. And they're supported from collapsing by the NSNS -NS flux that couples to the string. And because they're living very close to the boundary, their excitation spectrum is very redshifted and they basically have a continuum of excitations. And this continuum is not visible in the symmetric orbifold theory. So therefore, the symmetric orbifold theory can't have anything to do with the pure Nevis Schwartz, Nevis Schwartz uh, theories that are described by the West Amino written model. So that was the sort of conventional wisdom. So there were these special points, but clearly they didn't have anything to do with one another. Now, what we noticed some years ago is that the symmetric orbifold theory actually has what you would think of as being a higher spin symmetry. It contains this W infinity algebra, which is the hallmark of what should correspond to a higher spin symmetry in the corresponding ADS space. So this suggests that a symmetric orbifold theory should be dual to a tensionless string. And tensionless string should mean it should be dual to a string, as I said before, where the radius of the space is of the same size as the string length. So if you think about it from the point of view of these Vesuvino written models, if it's dual to any of them, it must be dual to the one with the smallest value of the level, because the level is basically a measure for the size of the ADS space in string units. Now, you may still be suspicious whether this works for the reasons I gave earlier, namely that's pure Nevis Schwartz and Schwartz flux and should have a continuum. But as you know, at very small string length things, the very stringy background, sometimes funny things happen that are not that's uh, sort of easily to guess based on geometry. So at least it's a plausible idea that maybe the symmetric orbifold theory is due to the Vesemino written model at the smallest possible value of the level. And this made us analyze this possibility in detail. So we went ahead and studied this theory in detail. Now this theory is a bit subtle and I'll hint a little bit on this because in the usual NSR formalism a la Maldestino Aguri, there's a problem with the theory as many people know, because the SU2 factor 
once we decouple the fermion, we we'll sit at negative level, and people have always thought that there's something funny about this theory. So our resolution is to describe this in the hybrid formalism where it's unproblematic to study the k equals to one case. And what we've shown is that if you take this seriously, we reproduce exactly the spectrum of the symmetric orbifold theory, and we also reproduce exactly the structure of the correlation functions. So there is something very special happening here. This continuum disappears for a reason I'll explain to you in a few minutes. And there is very good evidence that this theory is exactly due to the symmetric orbifold. And that's what I want to explain to you in the following. So it's slightly different than what people thought because they thought this Neve Schwartz, Neve Schwartz line would, nothing, would have nothing to do with the symmetric orbifold. Generically, that's true. But at the very smallest level, there's some, something special happening. And that theory seems to be exactly dual to the symmetric orbifold theory. So this is a work I've been doing together with Rajesh and then with Lawrence Eberhardt, and then later also with my, uh, Andrea Day and Bob Knighton, which are also PhD students of mine. So as I mentioned, the K level one theory is a bit tricky in the, in the Resumino written more in the, in the uh, NSR formalism, but there is this alternative formalism of Berkowitz, Waffer and Witten, which is called the hybrid formalism, where you go to effectively the sort of green Schwartz like version. And in that this describe ADS3 cross S3 in terms of the, the supergroup Resumino written model based on PSU 1, 1 slash 2 at level K. And then you have a topologically twisted sigma model for T4. And there is very good evidence that that theory is exactly dual to the Maldacino Gori background for any value of K at least K greater or equal than two. So for K equals to two, these two descriptions seem to be perfectly equivalent. The, the Maldacino Gori description for K equals to one is problematic, but this theory has no problems whatsoever at level one. But something very special happens at level one, which is probably the reason why the dictionary to the Neve Schwartz Ramon formalism breaks down. The fermions somehow sit in the wrong representation, and somehow the short representations don't fit into this NSR description. So, what happens at level one when you look at this super uh, affine Katsmudi algebra? Now, in order to understand that, actually, it's not that difficult to understand. And the simplest way to understand this is to observe that the bosonic subalgebra of the super affine algebra is just SL2 level one and SU2 level one. I mean, what PSU1 comma one slash two means is you have an SU1 comma one and you have an SU2 both at level one and then you have fermionic generators that sit in the by, by spinners of the two uh, bosonic subalgebras. So, so the bosonic subalgebra of this super affine Katsumori algebra is SL2 level one and SU2 level one. And if you know a little bit about conformal field theory, then you know that SU2 at level K has a very restricted set of representations, namely the spin of the highest weight states is between zero and K over two. So for K equals to one, there are only two possibilities. The ground state is either spin zero with respect to SU2 or it's spin a half with respect to SU2. These are the only possibilities. These are the only theories that are compatible with the null vector structure of the SU2 level one uh, affine Katsmudi algebra. But on the other hand, if you ask what are the generic highest rate representations of PSU 1, 1 slash 2, well, you have these fermionic generators and generically they produce a large representation of, uh, I mean, you can apply this uh, eight fermionic generators uh, many, many times. And if you start from some representation of SL2 that are labeled by the spin, I'm looking here at the continuous representations of SL2R and N labels the dimension of the SU2 representation. So you start from some state in your, in your Clifford module, and then you apply the fermionic generators, then a generic representation would look uh, as such, right? I mean, you start from here, you have four fermionic generators, they map you to these four, I mean, four creation operators that map you to these representations that lower the spin of SL2 by a half and lower or raise the spin of SU2 by a half. And then you complete the whole multiplet and that's the generic multiplet that you'll get. But if you look at this, you notice that if you start with a representation whose dimension is N with respect to the SU2 factor, then halfway down this diagram, you discover a representation whose dimension is N plus two. That's uh, once you apply two spin a half generators and both lift the spin upwards. But you know that for SU2 at level one, 
you can only have the zero in the one dimension representation, uh, sorry, the one in the two dimension representation, the spin one, zero and spin a half representation. So therefore, what you learn is that for k equals to one, you necessarily need a short representation of p is u one comma one slash two in order to be compatible with the constraint that simply come from the su two factor. Now, if you analyze this carefully, what you find is that there's only one representation that's allowed and it's this ultra short representation that has indeed the property that the SU2 representations is either one or two dimensional. And then the SL2 representations have to be of that form. But then in order for this shortening to be possible, you realize that the spin of the SL2 sector has to be exactly equals to a half. I, you are not allowed to take it to be a half plus IS with S being an arbitrary real number. Now, this is exactly where the continuum of the long string spectrum comes from. The S parameter describes the continuum of this, uh, of this Wessermino written model. And the fact that at level one, this is frozen out means there's no continuum. And therefore at level one, you have a chance that this may correspond to the symmetric orbifold theory, which also doesn't have a continuum. So that was the first important hint that maybe at level one, something very special will happen. And this general no-go theorem will not apply anymore. And the reason is very much the typical stringy reason that SU2 level one looks very different than a three sphere. SU2 level one looks like a circle, as you know. SU2 level one, despite the fact that it's the small radius regime of a strings on a three sphere, is actually equivalent to strings on a circle at a self dual radius. This is something you don't see geometrically. This is a stringy effect. And it's exactly this sort of stringy effect that's at the heart of making sure that at level one, there's no continuum. And we get a theory that has at least a chance to reproduce the symmetric orbital spectrum. Now, this theory actually is special in many other ways. In particular, it has a free field realization in terms of what we call some, or other people call symplectic bosons and real fermions. So fermions are just uh, uh, generators that satisfy anti-commutation relations of that kind. And symplectic bosons satisfy relations that look like spin a half particles, but they're bosonic. So they are sort of like, like, uh, like uh, bosonic ghosts. They are, they, are, they are bosonic, but they are spin a half. And these, if you combine them together and you look at the bilinears, they generate exactly u1, one, one slash two at level one. And then you have to divide out by some diagonal u1 factor to turn u1, one, one slash two into p as u1, one, one slash two. I mean, this has to do with the fact this has central charge zero, this has central charge minus two, and you have to sort of uh, divide out by U1 and quotient out by another U1, and that reduces the central charge by two and tends to from U1 comma one slash two to P as U1 comma one slash two. Now, if you think about, so, so, so now once we've understood sort of broadly what these uh, representations are, now we want to study the spectrum of the world sheet theory in detail and determine from it the spectrum of the space-time theory and see whether it matches the symmetric orbital. So if you think about it in terms of this free field realization, there are two natural representations. There is what you would think of the Neve Schwartz sector and the Ramon sector. In the Neve Schwartz sector, all the fields are half integer moded. In the Ramon sector, all fields are integer moded. And if you, we, we write this in terms of P is U1 comma one slash two, then the short sector gives you the vacuum representation. I should have mentioned that that's another possibility. And the Ramon sector gives you exactly the above short representation of P is U1 comma one slash two that I described to you in detail. And these are the only highest rate representations which this uh, super Lie algebra has. So if you draw them, uh, if you draw, uh, write out the SL2R quantum number and the conformal dimension, that's basically what the Ramon sector looks like. It's unbounded in either of these directions because the symplectic boson modes you can apply as many times as you want. And it uh, has a positive uh, L0 spectrum because it's a conventional highest rate representation. Now, already in the Neve Schwartz this Ramon description of Maldesino Guri, one of the key insights was that the highest rate representations won't suffice and you have to add in what are called spectrally flowed representations. The basic reason for that is that, you see, because you have a time direction, you know, somehow your L0 spectrum needs to be unbounded for the world sheet theory. This is like in, in flat space string theory. I mean, in flat space string theory, the, the L0 spectrum is unbounded because you can go to more time, more and more time-like momenta, and you need this. Otherwise, you, you get a trivial spectrum because you have to impose L0 is equal to one, say, in bosonic string theory, 
And if you sufficiently many excitations, that means the ground state has to have as negative L0 eigenvalue as possible. So something similar happens here. And the proposal of Maldesino Aguri is that these other representations are simply the spectrally flowed images of the representations from which we started. So in particular, what we propose is you take this Ramon sector representation and you take its spectrally flowed images. That's mimicking what Maldesino Aguri did in the Nourish Schwartz Ramon description. Now, I don't want to go into all the nitty gritty details of the spectral flow, but basically spectral flow means that there is an automorphism of this free, if you write it in terms of these free fields, there's an automorphism in terms of these free fields. You move the mode number up and down by say W over two in such a way that the commutation relations are respected. And then you think of this as a representation with respect to the tilde modes, the original representation, and then you interpret it as a representation with respect to the untilde modes. And if you do that, then with respect to the untilde modes, you get shifts in the eigenvalue of J3 and in the eigenvalue of L0 that comes from the normal ordering terms that you pick up from shifting the mode numbers up and down. And what you realize is that with respect to these uh, new modes, this representation isn't highest rate anymore because that's the line that describes all the states with L0 equal to zero. Here are the states with L0 positive and here are the states with L0 negative. And because it goes all the way to the right, there's no bound on how negative L0 can become. And that's what you need in order to get the sort of right stringy spectrum, which is uh, essentially what also motivated Maldesino Aguri to introduce the same sort of representations in the Nevis Schwartz Ramon uh, context. Okay, so that describes the world sheet theory completely, right? So we have the free fields and that they have a certain symmetry algebra. And I've just told you what are the representations of the free fields that appear in this world sheet theory. You take the Ramon sector, you take the spectrally flowed images, you combine them left and right with the same spectral flow, and you sum over all spectral, positive spectral flow numbers, and that's the spectrum you get. And now you can go ahead and ask, what is the symmetry, what is the physical space-time spectrum? Now you have a complete description of this world sheet theory. So you impose the physical state condition, you ask how many physical states are there, and what charges do they carry with respect to the conformal symmetry of the boundary theory? Now, what's important here is that P is U1, 1, 1 slash 2 has many, many null vectors. And effectively, that's a reflection of the fact that SU2 at level one is really only worth one boson rather than three. And similarly, SL2 at level, the P is U1, 1, 1 slash 2 at level one really only has two bosonic and fermionic oscillators. One way to see this is you have this uh, four symplectic bosons to start with, but then you have to divide out by this U1 and that basically kills two of them. So you only have two bosonic and fermionic degrees of freedom before you impose the physical state condition. And then the physical state condition basically kills two bosonic and fermionic degrees of freedom. And what you learn is that there are no physical states coming from the ADS3 cross S3 factor because it only had two bosonic oscillation modes to start with. And then the string theory physical state condition removes them. So the only degrees of freedom you retain come from the T4. And then if you count them and you keep track of the charges, what you see is that you reproduce exactly the single particle spectrum of the symmetric orbifold of T4, where the W cycle twisted sector of the symmetric orbifold comes from the W spectrally flowed sector on the world sheet. So you enumerate all the physical states of this theory, and you see that it reproduces exactly the spectrum of all the states of this, of all the single particle, i.e. single trace states or single cycle states from the point of view of the symmetric orbifold of the symmetric orbifold theory. So this is already quite a strong piece of evidence that the spectrum is correctly reproduced by this world sheet theory and not just the BPS spectrum, the entire single particle spectrum. Now, in identifying the spectrum is the first step, but in order to show that the theory is really the you would actually also like to show that the correlation functions are exactly the same. Now, this is a bit of a slightly more complicated story, but there's a very elegant picture that emerges. Now, it's a little bit complicated to describe, but maybe it's easiest to start by explaining what, the dual, what you should expect for the dual CFT. So suppose you start with the symmetric orbifold theory. The symmetric orbifold theory lives on a sphere, which is basically the boundary of ADS3. And in the symmetric orbifold theory, you're going to calculate some correlators with some twist fields. That's sort of the natural correlator you want to calculate. 
Now, as was uh, pointed out by Lunin and Matua, the smart way of calculating these correlators is to introduce a, a fictitious covering surface that undoes the twist of these twist fields. So you go to a covering surface where near each of these twist fields, you have a W-fold cover like a multi-story car park on top of them. So what this means is you're looking for a map from some fictitious uh, surface, possibly of higher genus, that has the property that Z, which lives up here, gets mapped to the X, which is the coordinate of the dual CFT, and it has this structure. So ZI gets mapped to XI, and near XI, it has a W-fold critical point. So, so this, is, uh, this is how you can calculate the symmetric orbifold correlators. And the idea is that once you've gone to the covering surface, the twist fields have basically disappeared. And then the, um, once the twist fields have disappeared, then it's basically the vacuum correlator and the entire correlator is captured in the, the nature of this covering, so, uh, in, in this nature of this covering map. So this is what you expect from the symmetric orbifold perspective. So this, and this was already pointed out some years ago, but this very strongly suggests is in particular, the one over N dependence of the symmetric orbifold correlators is related to the genus of the surface of this fictitious surface that you introduce out of nothing in order to calculate this correlator. What it suggests naturally is that this fictitious surface should be identified with the world sheet of the string theory, because then the one over N corrections to the symmetric orbifold correlators will come from the higher genus corrections of the world sheet, exactly as you would expect, because G string goes like one over N. So this suggests that the world sheet should be this covering surface that appears in the calculation of this symmetric orbifold correlators. And what this therefore suggests is that that should somehow emerge in our world sheet theory. So what we did is we calculated the correlators in our world sheet theory. And you have to be a little bit careful. These correlators depend on the Zs, which are the coordinates on the world sheet, but they also depend on the axes, which are the place where the corresponding vertex operator is inserted on the, on the dual CFT. And then, so we calculated these correlators and what we found quite remarkably is they are mostly zero and they're only non-zero provided the ZI are, are such that the holomorphic covering map with these properties exist. I should maybe mention that holomorphic covering maps with this property typically don't exist. There is very restrictive condition, typically they don't exist. They only exist for specific configurations of the ZIs and the XIs. And what you find is that these, this, the world sheet correlators are actually delta function localized near the positions where these holomorphic covering maps exist. So therefore, in theory, the moduli integral, where you integrate over all possible world sheets, this delta function basically picks out those points where a covering map exists. And you get a sum over all the covering maps with some coefficients. And that therefore has exactly the same structure as what you would expect from the Lunin Matur prescription. So this is a this is a very striking property of our world sheet theory, which we have derived uh, in particular in this paper. In this paper, we use the free field realization to show that it really is delta function localized. And therefore it produces manifestly the right structure to give you the symmetric orbifold correlators, including all higher genus corrections. So this is, I think, a very good indication that that world sheet here really exactly reproduces for you the symmetric orbifold correlators. We haven't proven it entirely because we haven't calculated these numbers in detail. There's some argument what they should be, but we haven't honestly calculated these numbers, but we see that it has exactly the structure of the way you would calculate the symmetric orbifold correlator. <clears throat> Alaluni Matur, excuse me. Now, <clears throat> in this uh, in this free field paper, the way you saw this localization property was actually by some remarkable identity which correlators uh, satisfied. Namely, they had the property that this combination inserted into the physical correlator is identically zero, and that looks very much like the incidence relation in twister space. So these look like twister variables, and gamma of z should be identified with x. So this is basically telling you what the space time point is written as the incidence relation of twister space. And that seems to be the correct interpretation of our world sheet theory. Now, once you, once you observe that, there is a very natural guess 
for how you can generalize this to ADS5, because you can try to mimic this Twister description also for ADS5. <clears throat> so given the structure of for the, what happened for ADS3 because 3, what we propose is that, and at the moment, this is a bit of a wild guess, that the correct generalization is that you should simply double the number of symplectic bosons and real fermions on the world sheet. You, you don't have a T4 anymore. So basically, instead of having a T4, you put in another copy of four symplectic bosons and four real fermions. Now, the first indication that you're on the right track is that they generate U2,2 slash 4 at level 1, just like half of it generated U1,1 at slash 2 at level 1. And you get from this P is U2,2 slash 4 at level one, after you divide up by new one, just like mimicking what we did for ADS3. Now that's interesting because you see, you know, three N equals to four super mills has a global symmetry, which is P as U2, comma two slash four. So at least you are producing the correct global symmetry of the dual CFT. And you have a chance that the spectrum of the dual CFT will naturally sit in the representations of P as U2, comma two slash four, which is already a good indication that maybe you're doing the right thing. Now, if you, if you write out these uh, component fields, so what we have is we have uh, two sets of symplectic bosons, and then we have four free fermions. And uh, so, so they satisfy exactly the same commutation relations as before. So the lambdas and the mu's, they satisfy exactly the commutation relation we had before. And similarly for the uh, lambda daggers, sorry, lambda and mu dagger and mu and lambda dagger, they satisfy one set of symplectic bosons and then the fermions satisfy another, uh, the, the usual uh, four fermion theory. And if you look at it, this actually looks very, very similar to the ambitwister fields that Berkowitz introduced to describe string theory in ADS5 cross S5. And given the fact that our world ship theory wants to be somehow a twister theory, maybe that's the sort of correct uh, theory we should be aiming for. Now, Berkowitz's theory is slightly different. He introduced an additional U1 field. He didn't have spectrally float sectors and so on. So there are key differences, but the field content, at least before you exactly explain what the spectrum is, looks at least very similar. And indeed, this looks like the ambitwister fields on ADS5 cross S5. So this is another indication that maybe we are on the right track. Now, as I said before, you, you, you get P as U2, 2 slash 4. So how does this work? You look at the bilinears where you take one of the Y fields, I one of the fields with the depth, and one of the fields without the decker. And then you just look at the normal ordered products of these and they generate U2, 2 slash 4 at level one. And then if you divide by this U1 field, which is this U1 field by which you have to divide, and that will play a role later on, you get P as U2, 2 slash 4 at level one. Now this construction is actually also familiar to people who are familiar with string theory in ADS5 versus five, or rather with people who are familiar with the uh, uh, integrability approach to n equals to four super mills, because this is really the current algebra version of the oscillator construction of PSU 2, 2 slash 4, which enters into the spin chain description. So when people describe the spin chain, they also introduce such gen generators, except they just have a single generator because they just see the global PSU 2, 2 slash 4 algebra. And what we are doing is really the current algebra version of it, where we have an affine algebra in this manner. But again, that's connects to yet something else that naturally appears for ADS5 cross S5 or N equals to four super mills. Now, the key step is to exactly say what the representations are that appear on the world sheet. And our guiding principle is that we should try to mimic what happens for ADS3. And for the case of ADS3, Essentially, all the non-trivial aspects come from spectral flow. I didn't explain it in detail, but I told you that the W cycle twisted sector came from the W spectrally flowed sector. Now, in ADS3, we decided to spectrally flow depending on the eigenvalues of the J3 eigenvalue, which becomes the conformal dimension of the dual CFT minus the SU2 R symmetry on the world sheet. Uh, sorry, the SU2 R symmetry of the dual CFT. Now for ADS5, the natural idea is that you should do the same, except instead of the conformal dimension, you should have the dilatation operator of n equals to four, and this should be replaced by some R symmetry generator inside the SU4. So, so if you follow your nose, these are the, the spectral flow relations you write down. I 
again, you relate the tildes to the m tildes theory, but, and some of them get moved up and down by w over two, and they get moved up and down depending on their eigenvalue with respect to d0 minus r0, which is a natural generalization for what we did in ADS3. Now, if so here it's convenient to start with the Novi-Schwarz representation, but it doesn't really make a big difference. We could also start with the Ramon sector, rep sector representation. And then, as I said before, the untilde modes act on the conventional Novi-Schwarz representation, and you interpret it in terms of the, uh, sorry, the tilde modes act on the, on the original representation, and you interpret it in terms of the untilde modes. So for example, if you look at this generator, this generator kill the Novi-Schwarz vacuum if R is greater or equal than a half, so this guy will kill the Novi-Schwarz vacuum if the mode number is greater or equal to W plus one over two, because uh, that's what you get from here. And likewise, you can go through all the others. So those that get moved upwards, they appear in the first line, and those that get moved downwards appear in the second line. I mean, they just tell you which modes will annihilate the ground state. Now, these are free fields. So those generators that annihilate annihilate, and everybody else creates a free Fox space because it's a free theory. There are no other relations. So if these are the modes that uh, annihilate, then the correspond, then the complementary modes will generate the full Fox space. So if you look at the, at the generators from the first line, they will create, if R is less or equal than W minus one over two, and the generators from the second line, they will create if R is less or equal than minus W plus one over two. So a natural way to organize it is to say that everybody will create if their mode number is less than minus W plus one over two. But from the first line, you also have generators that act as creation operators, provided their mode number lies within this wedge. I mean, this is just another way of organizing to say which generators create the Fox space from the ground state. Now, this is the point where we are making an inspired guess. We don't have the Berkowitz buffer witten theory here at our disposal. We don't quite know yet exactly how you impose the physical state condition. Our intuition is that the correct way of imposing the physical state condition is the following. The physical state condition and our intuition is that that should be some sort of n equals to four critical string, but we haven't worked out the details. It should remove all out of the wedge modes. So all the modes whose mode number is more negative than W plus one over two should not be physical. So it should in some sense become an effectively topological theory and it should retain the wedge modes, but it shouldn't retain wedge modes separately from left and right movers. You should think of them as sort of like generalized zero modes. They should only retain one copy from left and right movers together. So this is a postulate, and this is uh, something we haven't yet found the first principles derivation of it. That's what we are trying to, currently trying to understand better, how to write down a cohomology that will achieve that. But in some sense, you can say you can reverse engineer a cohomology that will achieve that, because uh, as I'll explain to you in a second, this at least gives you the right answer. So maybe what this tells you is that a correct string theory description will be such that this will be the outcome. And this is a bit inspired by uh, the solutions of this Berkowitz theory, uh, classical solution, which were studied in these papers. And they also have a certain number of holomorphic modes and non-holomorphic modes. So the holomorphic modes are effectively in one-to-one -one correspondence with this wedge mode. So this looks like generalized zero modes. So, so this is our proposal. After imposing the physical state condition, you just retain these wedge modes. But then there are two residual gauge conditions you still have to impose. First of all, you have to impose that this U1 condition is still satisfied. This is, remember, we need this U1 condition to go from U1, 1, 1, U2, 2, slash 4 to P is U2, 2, slash 4. But here we've forgotten about this. So this we still have to impose. So we have to impose that all the states are annihilated by the positive generators of this U1 that cuts down U2, 2, slash 4 to P is U2, 2, slash 4. And then the second condition is a little bit less well motivated, but you should think of it as some sort of real uh, mass shell type condition. And if you are a little bit inspired by BMN, you would think that uh, the BMN condition, if you ignore the oscillator, should be that L0 is uh, minus two P minus P plus. P plus seems to play the role of this uh, W and then uh, P minus in the BMN limit, you think will become an integer. So this should become a condition that tells you that L0 should be a multiple of W. 
But again, this is a bit hand-waving. We don't have an honest first principles derivation. What we propose is that once the dust is settled, you end up with these wedge modes, one copy of the wedge modes subject to these conditions. And I think it's plausible, but we haven't yet derived it. Now, if you accept that, then we can show that this reproduces exactly the spectrum of pre n equals to four sweeping mills in the planar limit. And actually, this is very easy to see. So if you remember, so we have these modes, the wedge modes. Um, so they run between minus w minus one over two and w minus one over two. So they look like momentum modes. So if you inverse Fourier transform them, you can turn them into position modes. So you have w position modes. And these w position modes, they will commute with one another if they sit at different positions. So we do this for the z's and the y's. And then we see that uh, out of these wedge uh, uh, momentum modes, we can make W position modes that look like oscillators that sit at different positions along something that begins to look like a spin chain. And then the condition that Cn is equal to zero for the whole configuration translates into the condition that C is equal to zero at each side. So what we end up with at each side, we have the y's and the z's, different sides commute with one another and each side, which generate everything that the y's and the z's makes modulo to the condition that the C generator is zero. And that now looks exactly like the oscillator construction of uh, PSU 2,2 slash four of the spin chain. And what you get is exactly the singleton representation sitting at each of the W points of what begins to look like a spin chain. And then this condition translates into the fact that you have to impose a cyclic invariance on this W states from the W singleton representation. So what this tells you is you end up with a W fold tensor product of the singleton representation subject that you only keep the states that are invariant under cyclic symmetry that rotates the, the, the W combinations in a cyclic manner. And as has been known for some time, that reproduces exactly the spectrum of free n equals to four super mills. So you see that in some sense, this starts to begin to look like a spin chain where these twister variables that, that are the momentum modes whose associated position modes seem to be the position modes associated to a, w, a spin chain with length w. So, so, so this is the, the picture that emerges that from the w spectrally flowed sector, what you get are all the super mill states that involve w letters, where each letter is any of the fields of the n equals to four super mills theory, i a scalar or fermion, including all its derivatives. And it really looks as though that these twister modes behave like string bits on the world sheet. They give you this, uh, this, uh, um, this spin chain type description with w many sides, but at each side you have somehow these twister value fields rather than directly the n equals to four fields. And that seems to emerge naturally from this quite natural generalization of our ADS3 world sheet here. So this is how this all seems to fit together. And I think it sort of connects with various pieces people thought should be relevant for ADS5 plus S5 and equals to four super mills. So we feel this somehow has a very good chance to really be the correct description, the correct world sheet description dual to free n equals to four super mills. I'm running a little bit out of time. So one can one can generate, the, we've checked that one can generate the full spectrum. I mean, so we have to remember, you have to impose these two conditions. So you can ask, how can you generate them systematically? There's some sort of DDF-like construction. And that seems to, that produces for you the entire spectrum. These generators satisfy something that looks a little bit like a Youngian. So maybe one can connect this to the Youngian symmetry. And we can enumerate the low-lying states by explicitly writing down which world sheet degree of freedom reproduces which piece of the free n equals to four spectrum. So we've enumerated this for small values of W and it works exactly as expected, but in some sense, that's just a consistency check on our general argument that I described for you earlier. One can also ask how this works for ADS3 and there is a natural ADS3 version of it. I mean, here we're doing something slightly different because we don't have the berkowitz buffer witten cohomology argument. We have to invent what our physical state condition is out of thin air. So it's good to check that it reproduces some sensible bit for ADS3 and that seems to work out. So we are reasonably confident that that is the correct description. So let me try to wrap up. 
so I think the free field realization for ADS3 because this tree that is a dual to the symmetric orbifold theory that I think we have under very good control. There are many, many consistency checks. The spectrum matches exactly, the correlators match exactly. They suggest a relatively natural generalization to ADS5 plus S5, where you basically double the free field degrees of freedom that appear for ADS3 plus S3. Now, in the ADS5 story, we don't have a, a first principles derivation for the physical spectrum, but a natural guess for what the physical state condition will amount to. And if you believe this guess, you find that it reproduces exactly the single trace spectrum of three n equals to four super mills uh, from this world sheet theory. So I think this opens the door for a proof of the ADS CFT correspondence in that case, because here is at least the candidate world sheet theory together with open questions that has a very good fighting chance to give you exactly three n equals to four super mills. But obviously, we are at the very early stage of this development, so there are many open questions. So, for example, one of the key questions is, uh, can we understand this physical state condition from first principles? Then we would like to study the correlators. We would believe this localization type uh, incidence relation should work similarly here. That should allow us to do perturbation theory away from the free case. And then there are many things. I mean, you can look at uh, deep brains, you can try to understand the Youngian symmetry and the higher spin symmetry from a more manifest world sheet point of view. And there are many questions that are opened by this, uh, by this uh, proposal, but I think this has a good chance to be the correct world sheet description dual to three n equals to four super mills. And it would be interesting to explore this further. So I'll thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Session is now open for question and comment. Do you have any question or comment? So can I ask a question? So sure. in BMN case, we have some uh, we have oscillator which is related to string theory, string theory yes. oscillator, and that's correspond to impurities among BN BMN operators. So in your case, do you have some counterpart of the such oscillator in yeah. your home? Yeah, we've, we've been trying to make sense. I, I mean, a priori, you see, BMN is in the large, is in the supergravity limit, and we are in the opposite limit. So BMN is a far, a long way away from us. On the other hand, it feels like a sort of covariant version of BMN. So our rough idea is that these modes are like the BMN oscillators. So you see, the BMN oscillators, you don't have to impose the C condition. So, so these modes are generated in such a way that they commute with this condition. So they automatically map physical states to physical states, except you have to impose the L0 condition. So the way we think about it is that these are basically the BMN oscillators and the L0 condition is the momentum conservation con or the cyclicity condition from the point of BMN. I mean, remember there, you have to impose that there are as many left moving excitations as right moving excitations. So some of these modes look like left moving excitations. Some of these modes look like right moving excitation. The L0 condition is the, is the, uh, the momentum conservation condition from the point of BMN. And these operators look a little bit like the BMN operators. And, um, and they're exactly like the momentum operators. I mean, they're the impurities. And in some sense, that's what we are undoing when we are when we are doing here, right? We are going from the momentum modes to the position mode. So these are described in the localized position where you add an impurity. But we, we do this on the level of the symplectic boson fields and the fermions, whereas the BMN operators are probably more directly related to this by linear. So, so we haven't entirely understood this. We are not entirely sure to which extent there should be a totally sharp dictionary, given the fact that we are at pretty different points in the moduli space, but that's roughly speaking how it looks. Thank you very much. Also, can you derive your uh, tangent string action or twister string action from uh, just taking a small radius limit of standard ADS5 cross S5? Yeah, that, that we haven't understood yet either. I mean, that's exactly how this should arise. You see, that's exactly what happened for ADS3 cross S3, right? Because there, you basically write on a sigma model, you get this PSU 1, 1 slash 2 at level K, and then at level 1, you see it has a free field realization, that's the theory we work with. So that connects it nicely to the geometry of ADS3 cross S3. So here, to do something similar, but that we haven't yet managed to do. But it's also complicated because 
this is really a sort of more twistorial description. And um, yeah, so you somehow have to go from the sigma model type variables of, um, of these various actions that have been written down to the twister variables. It's not entirely clear to us how to do this, but that would be very satisfying indeed to connect this sort of more to the conventional geometry of ADS5 process 5. At the moment, this is sort of really, we make an inspired guess for what the world sheet theory is at one point in this moduli space, but we have no idea of how this relates to the rest of the moduli space. I see. But I, sorry, actually, I mean, there's one thing you could try to do. You could try to sort of switch on the coupling constant that corresponds to turning on the volume, but the problem is that you have to go a long, long way before you go to the large volume regime. That's the key problem in relating it, but that may be possible eventually. Uh, I see. Thank you very much. Uh, so well, I have one more question. So do you, so from any California means, for example, people do some OB4 to reduce and supersymmetry. Do you think there yeah. are chances that we can consider ADS CFT for non-supersymmetric? Uh, uh, sorry, right, good. So, yeah, actually together with the postdoc, Francesco Galvano, we are looking at the, uh, the OB4 that reduce it to any equals to two uh, as a first step. So yeah. that seems to work quite nicely. So there is a, so as you know, you can take an orbifold of n equals to four super mills that reduces it to n equals to two or n equals to one. And that seems to correspond on the world sheet to a natural orbifold action of the free symplectic bosons and fermions. Actually, it's only an orbifold action on the fermions. And we are currently working out the details for how this works. And the hope would be that you can go from n equals to four to n equals to two, n equals to one, maybe even down to n equals to zero. But at the moment, we are just trying to understand the n equals to two story. Thank you very much. Other question? <laughs> uh, I have a naive question. So, can you see a uh, um, SUM gauge group of n equal four supremes from your perspective? No, no, no. You don't. I mean, you see. I mean, you see. You should only see the gauge invariant operators, right? I mean, you don't. Yeah, yeah, that's true. But uh, in any case, um, I mean, there's no. Yeah, I don't know. I mean. I mean, you know, you would expect n to correspond to g, one over n corresponding to g string. So you would expect that the higher, I mean, I mean, this picture we strongly believe will also work in uh, in this context. So, 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 so this picture, you see, this picture only hinges on the structure of the symplectic bosons. I mean, the symplectic bosons is what make this work. And the symplectic bosons for ADS5 are just twice as many as for ADS3. So you'd believe that something like that should happen. And then you, what you would see is that depending on the current, so the problem here is that for ADS5, this is not a 2D surface anymore. This is a four-dimensional space-time. So you're looking at maps from a two-dimensional surface to a 4D space-time, and they want to be holomorphic, but exactly what it means to be holomorphic I, exactly what's the analog of the holomorphic covering map is something we are still a little bit struggling with to identify. It's probably holomorphic in some twister space description of this, uh, of the dual, of the, of n equals to, of the four dimensional space in which n equals to four lives. But what we believe is that ultimately n will emerge via the fact that you see the higher genus corrections reproducing the one of n corrections, right? the non planar corrections. So I think n you will see in that sense, but I don't think SUN, I don't see how we see this. There's certainly no, no direct sign of SUN being there. You really have, you only see probably the gauge in, I mean, you only see the, the single trace uh, operators and you don't know what you are tracing over, right? I mean, in some sense, you're just seeing that, but you're not seeing directly the SUN, at least not, not at the moment. As you thank you very much. Any other questions? Uh, thank you for the nice talk. And uh, can can you calculate uh, Wilson loop expectation value from your world sheet formalism? Uh, that I haven't thought about. That I haven't thought about. Um, I mean, I think at the moment what what we are trying to do is to calculate. Uh, sort of the, I mean, calculate this, right? We are trying to calculate uh, the correlation functions of local operators. 
mm -hmm. and try to see how they behave uh, if you perturb away from the free case, which means you switch on the perturbation that corresponds to the tooth parameter. So that we understand what this means from the world sheet so that we can calculate. Mm -hmm. This should become some localized function. So the modular world sheet integral should localize to isolated points, should become a sum over suitable covering maps. And what you would hope is that this will reproduce the spin chain description of the calculation of the correlators from ADS5. Now, how a Wilson loop operator, which is the non-local operator, would fit into that, that I haven't thought about. Yeah, that's um, yeah, that that we haven't yet thought about. Okay, thank you very much. Other question coming? Can you say a little bit more about uh, this higher spin and Yangian perspective? Yeah, so I mean, so so you can write down these operators, and these operators map physical states to physical states in the sense that they commute. With this condition. So they state that it satisfies this condition to a state that satisfies this condition. And they're like DDF operators, i.e., you have to sort of make sure that their mode numbers align correctly so that to satisfy the physical state condition. Now, these operators, you can calculate their, their, their commutators. And their commutators is not trivial, uh, but it basically looks like the, the Borel sub, the sort of truncated Borel subalgebra of the affine Katsmudi algebra, which isn't quite the young end, but it's sort of, um, it's like the, the bilinear correction term is zero. So it smells a little bit that, and this is the sort of spectrum generating algebra. So you would expect, because the young end generates all the physical states, they sit in one representation of the, or sit in few representations of the young end, you would expect that somehow the young end generators somehow to have something to do with these generators, which are the spectrum generating operators from our world sheet perspective. But, Beyond that, we haven't understood uh, how that how that will work out. It's the uh, symmetry of n equal four super young myth at free level. But I mean, so 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 PSU two comma two slash four we see manifestly because these are just the zero modes from here. So PSU two comma two slash four we see manifestly because they map physical states to physical states. So we know everybody sits in representations of PSU two comma two slash four. Now we know that n equals to four super mills also have a young in symmetry, so there should be somehow you should see that the states, the physical states of your space time theory, must organize themselves in representations of the young, and there must be a reflection of the generators that produce for you this young in representation on the world sheet. And somehow it's probably related to these, but exactly how this goes, we haven't understood. Okay, thank you. Good time is. So if there's no question, then let us close this section. Uh, thank you very much. Nice talk.